this is part of a whole series on global systemic risk, which is a fascinating concept and emerging field of theory modeling and case studies. And it's a real privilege to be here and thank you for your, for your introduction and also for your support. Um, because this material is somewhat controversial, I've written it out, um, which I often don't do. So there's a clear documentation of what I'm talking about. Um, my talk differs from <clears throat> the work of uh, some members by identifying that, that who tend to identify chains of events and cascades of failure that have or might occur if there were an outbreak of Ebola in Manhattan or a meltdown of a nuclear reactor. Um, for systemic risk in the development and marketing of prescription drugs involves active agents constructing systems of risk and risk allocation to advance their own ends. Um, so there's a, a willful design of risks in their allocation, both beneficial and costly. Um, and it's more akin, in some ways, to two other presentations in the fall series. The first one is the uh, Cuban Missile Crisis, which was discussed in late October, and also the blockade of, Len of Leningrad in December. The reason I say they're somewhat akin is that neither is a natural disaster, um, but rather they involve active agents on both sides constructing strategies to advance their interests and defend themselves against risks from the other party. Um, they really happened in one place at one time and were actively created and pursued, and that makes them somewhat different. As risks and responses to them did not turn out as expected, leaders had to figure out how to adjust their strategies. Systemic risk in uh, the development and marketing of drugs is a far more hopeful and positive topic than either one of those. And the parallel I'm drawing is only to uh, the importance of agency and responsibility in these cases as, as distinct from systemic risks in complex systems, for example, as famously analyzed by Charles Perrault and his concept of normal accidents or extrinsic events or disasters like a tsunami or the outbreak of a global disease. Um, these reflections have led me to, be, to begin with some, concept, some thoughts about the concept of glo global systemic risk itself. Uh, I'm a medical and economic sociologist who studied several kinds of organizational, institutional, and system-wide risks and been involved in some of them. And one reason I like sociology and anthropology is that they emphasize ironies of reality um, that people and institutions, of the realities that people and institutions construct. Ironic distance often threatens uh, those who are really sure that something is as it is. Um, and to some extent, they're right. But if you have a comparative, historic, and ironic perspective on constructed events, it leads to one's appreciating the situated na nature of a given constructed reality. Well, first it seems to me one faces the paradox that the more tightly and precisely one defines global systemic risk, the fewer examples meet the criteria and the more examples of significant risks will not qualify. Some neglected diseases, for example, largely exist in developing countries and are not global. They make tens of millions of people chronically ill and hundreds of thousands die. Um, but these huge, and these huge risks are systematically related to the structure of poverty both within uh, most countries and across the globe. Some are systemically related to their environments or ecosystems in tightly coupled ways in some cases and more loosely coupled in others, but few of them are global. And the ones that are global, like rotavirus, um, are ironic in other ways that we don't have time to go into. Um, but one of the interesting things is that uh, rotavirus vaccines are required in the countries that least need them and are least available in the countries that most need them. So that's something one could think about. Perhaps the term global may reach too far or define an example 
in a less helpful way than using international or regional. Uh, an important review of globalization studies, Mauro Gillian, uh, Gillen at the Wharton School in the Department of Sociology at the University of Pennsylvania concluded that globalization is a fragmented, incomplete, discontinuous, contingent, and in many ways contradictory and puzzling process. Thus, ironic distance is needed in considering the term and its uses. If the term international were substituted, it would allow conceptually for considering many more interesting and important studies of regional and substantially and substantively linked cases of sy systemic risk. In the case of pharmaceuticals, you will see that some of them are more global than others for reasons I will try to explain. But let's look for a moment at energy exploration and production for oil and gas um, that pertain to several countries and have international linkages that major companies and countries have developed, largely to, ba to balance short-term and long-term risk with revenues and profit margins. But these risks of production are not global. The consequences may be global, but they too vary significantly by how much energy countries or subregions need and by the degree to which countries depend on imported oil as distinct from other sources of energy. Thus, if one mapped national and regional needs for oil and gas, both in absolute and relative terms, one would find huge variations in the consequences and risk exposure of international exploration. Second, if the global system is defined as a set of tightly coupled interactions that allow for the continued flow of information, capital, goods, services, and people, then more loosely coupled and partially coupled or intermittently coupled interactions could be overlooked. The term systemic and systemic risk uh, as, uh, in, in some parts of global systemic theory uh, point to actually non-systemic events, to spontaneous formations, to sudden nonlinear non transitions whose effects are difficult to forecast and can be, quote, a driver of critical transitions to, quote, emergent risk as an endogenous threat and to networking that suggests loose rather than tight coupling. So the internal um, discussion itself indicates uh, benefits of relaxing perhaps the criteria. It also seems to me that, that the term risk needs more critical attention. Whose risks and what kinds of outcomes are regarded as risks? In my work as an advisor to Doctors Without Borders on how to make vaccines more affordable and accessible to young people in 150 of the roughly 180 countries in the world, I was brought up short by a listener coming up and saying, but aren't diseases and cancers natural forms of population control? Uh, if we vaccinate and medicate successfully, populations will grow unsustainably and age unsustainably. This Malthusian perspective dates back to the 18th century and was the focus of intense debates about whether systemic efforts to do good, like increasing the food supply to reduce risks of starvation and disease, uh, might spell long-term suffering and disaster for whole populations. The, ac the access campaign at Médecins Sans Frontières is so focused on preventable disease being the risk uh, diseases being the risks, that no one ever thinks of their prevention as being a risk. Um, are the systemic vaccine campaigns of the World Health Organization, Médecins Sans Frontières, and UNICEF a source of global risk? Today we find this way of thinking offensive, and I raise it to illuminate a theoretical question about global systemic risk. Which risks, to whom, are considered politically correct, and which offensive and even unthinkable? What role does political culture play? Who defines what is a risk and by what criteria? And we will see, I thought I had a coffee here. Oh yes. We will see that um, the changing construction of political culture uh, plays an important role in
in my view, increasing global systemic risk in pharmaceuticals. That's coming up. So these examples point to another need embedded in identifying who is defining, quote, risks and what risks seem to matter by whom, namely agency and power. To what extent does the term systemic in global systemic risk focus attention on the risks that affect institutions, corporations, and states more than on the millions of individuals affected by how leaders respond to a perceived risk? What are the complementary risks of those individuals? And to what extent does the analysis of GSR attend to questions of agency? When one is told that systemic risk analysis does not focus on individuals or individual companies, I can understand the mathematical and intellectual reasons why, yet often the people saved or harmed are individuals. For example, if one is looking at systemic risk in credit cards, one is looking at systems of allocation and profiting from constructions of risk designed by large corporations. They make, they make no money from affluent people like us who pay their credit cards every month. But as powerful agents of risk design and allocation, they draft legislation and lobby for usury terms of interest on unpaid balances that quickly sink tens of millions of working class and middle class individuals, even in affluent societies, into cycles of permanent debt, where the minimum monthly payments lead victims to paying exorbitant charges on the remaining balance. Uh, in cutting this, I, <laughs> I had some sentences about how some fellow parents in Princeton have children who, in becoming adults, have maxed out their credit cards and had to be rescued by their parents. Uh, these systemic risk structures <coughs> um, lead to a cascade of soft and hard failures. The structure and cascade apply most to working and lower class people, making them even more Im impoverished and powerless. One knock-on effect has been the construction of a secondary tier of companies that will consolidate multiple credit card debts <coughs> um, and then charge a lower fee on the consolidated principal. So these examples highlight the issue of agency and power. Who defines how much risk is acceptable and who is responsible for given patterns of loss or harm? What strategies are used to hide or downplay the perception of risk so that actor victims uh, believe they can take a risk more safely than is really the case? These questions are central to the development and marketing of prescription drugs. Often it seems as if no one is responsible for the losses or harms in systemic risk analysis. This can even be systemically built into the design of the study or of actions. So the Enron case comes to mind where shell games were constructed to obscure risks and losses and to delink responsibility from losses, which were then covered up by deceptions. And deception is an important factor in some large scale schemes of risk. That also applies to uh, pharmaceuticals, as you'll see soon. Agency power and influence are increasingly salient to systemic risk promotion that has become big business for companies that offer services or products for risk prevention, reduction, or management, generating a perception of systemic risks and a sense of safety for drugs to ameliorate those risks are central to drug companies' sales and profits. Many cases could be given, such as the incorporation into the term depression of sadness, grief, loss, and disappointment. So they become medicalized and clinical protocols call for prescriptions. There's some important newer books on the loss of sadness. Or the corporate construction of bipolar as a new term and ex an, an extension of the classic diagnosis of manic depression or the corporate recasting of anxieties about life into social anxiety disorder, which conveniently uh, spells sad, uh, into, medical, into a medical condition and diagnosis that opened a huge market with variable benefits 
a tendency towards addiction and to corporate construction uh, and to substantial side effects. Or the expansion of osteoporosis to the corporate construction of osteopenia by creating a new institute to promote the disease, develop, developing machines that measured peripheral reductions in bone density, getting Congress to approve their use by doctors as a reimbursable procedure, and then multiplying prescriptions for an expensive drug, all for a disease that independent reviewers think doesn't really exist. In fact, Roy um, Moynihan, a senior medical writer for the British Medical Journal, or the BMJ, has written a book called Selling Sickness. It describes the ways in which pharmaceutical companies medicalize and widen clinical criteria for being prescribed a drug for 10 common conditions. And I thought I'd bring that along if anyone wants to look at it. Um, to summarize so far, I, there are several broad theoretical points I'd like to summarize. First, a lot of systemic risk of importance is international or regional, but not global. Um, second, um, that the cascades of failure from given systemic risk often vary greatly by poverty, rur rurality, and geography, from a few small cascades to many large cascades. Thus, a risk may become more systemic and consequential in some places and among some populations than others. Some kinds of systemic risk involve non-systemic events, actions, or accidents. And a lot involve humans designing systems of risk. These humans usually work for powerful companies or governments. Agency and the role of power need to be part of a theory of systemic risk. The risk makers and system makers seek profit, power, or reduction of their own risks. Ideally, they, se they seek less risk and more profit at the expense of others. Consequential harms may be regarded as, quote, externalities, unquote, outside their model or frame of responsibility. Systemic <coughs> risk studies need to define what they mean by risk, what kinds, for whom, and who benefits, and who loses, or as Peter Blau used to say in his graduate course, cui, cui bono. Systemic risk has become big business, and corporations manufacture and create or expand a risk in order to sell more products or services to prevent, prevent it, or even better, to manage it for more repeat business. So let's turn now to uh, pharmaceuticals. I've forgotten about my slides. Sorry about that. Um, right. <clears throat> um, most advances in modern medicine stem from developments in surgery or drugs or both. Medicine is the continental term that includes um, vaccines and also over-the-counter drugs with an active bio, with a bioactive ingredient, are central to modern medicine. A central uh, conclusion of James Fanu's widely cited history, The Rise and Fall of Medicine, is that many, perhaps most pharmaceutical advances were made by 1990, and here's I brought Fanu's history in case somebody wanted to have a look at it. That's the revised edition. Fanu reports that while about 70 new molecular entities were approved each year during the 1960s, that number declined to about 30 uh, or less in uh, 1970. And many of them were just minor variations on established medicines that were cheaper and treated a medical problem. Frustrated with this failure after 1970 to find better cures for serious diseases, the pharmaceutical industry turned to creating new markets for lifestyle conditions and problems by expanding and medicalizing them and even inventing new ones like osteopenia. So wonderful, colorful story. Another one that has a 
a great book on it, is on the, the uh, sustained effort that's still going on to uh, define as a medical diagnosis female sexual disorder and to uh, give it a diagnosis and to create a treatment for it. Uh, this greatly increased the number of people taking drugs and turning millions of manifestly healthy people into lifetime patients. Now they came in to see their physicians be tested for signs of hidden risks that needed control. I'm going to go into just one example of this to give a little more in-depth illustration, and that is um, high, cholest high bad cholesterol uh, as a global risk for heart disease, uh, apparently and promoted as being um, a risk throughout the world. Well, a generation ago, no one knew what cholesterol was or that they had some in their body. Uh, large numbers of commercially supported researchers, science writers, and journals, journalists generated a story of bad cholesterol and good cholesterol and high cholesterol and low cholesterol. And what's your number? And are you looking after your number? And what are you doing about it? From a historical perspective, a whole system of risk perception measurement and management developed. The larger change illustrated here has led us to increasingly viewing our bodies as rife with these hidden risks that we need to uh, be alert for and uh, look after and manage. Um, meantime, companies and their global networks of medical writers, <coughs> editors, and producers have also emphasized how safe statins are here was a modern miracle, first identifying a hidden, deadly risk that no one knew about a generation ago, and then developing a drug to control it so that you could be healthier and go around being assured that you weren't going to have a heart attack anytime soon. Medical guideline committees kept lowering the threshold of when cholesterol was considered high, and patients in need of a, of a statin to lower the risk. <clears throat> Each notch in the lowering threshold um, substantially increased the area under the tail of the, of the demographic curve, redefining millions whose cholesterol was normal before and now as high and risky. The number of Americans regarded as bearing a, a hidden risk too high to go untreated rose from 13 million to 36 million to 40 million as expert committees lowered the threshold. But independent studies found that many of the committee members were being paid by or were on the payroll of the pharmaceutical companies who made statins and who stood to make large profits from patented statins by redefining the uh, risk threshold. Critics claim that so-called bad cholesterol is a myth and that statins to lower it may increase Alzheimer's disease as a side effect. From the perspective of manufacturers, such risks are, are an externality and also uh, a new market for selling drugs to people for Alzheimer's disease. So uh, one of the ironies of all of this is the more medicines you take, the more side effects you have, and then the more those need to be tr treated and so on. I think Dr. Zeus called it turtles all the way down. <clears throat> this illustrates the, in the interdependent chains of events we live in um, which one professor of history and psychiatry is called Pharmageddon. According to independent critics of global systemic creation and promotion of high bad cholesterol as a risk, prescribing statins as a primary prevention and focusing on lowering bad cholesterol as an end in itself so that tens of millions ingest statins daily does not reduce cardiovascular risk much and it exposes millions to shorter and longer term harmful side effects that have been downplayed. A growing number of independent researchers claim that the risk of taking statins, uh, the risks have been buried by drug companies and researchers supported by them. Adverse risks are especially important when drugs are taken by tens of millions, so a low rate actually affects hundreds of thousands, and for months or even a lifetime. So the worst drug disaster in 
contemporary history was around Vioxx. And one of the things that made it so, so terrible and killed about the number of people who were killed in the Vietnam War from one drug um, was that it was so widely promoted <clears throat> so that up to 80 million people were taking it. So the low rate amounted to an awful lot of heart attack, stroke, and death. Um, returning to statins, muscle pain and depression are already known as adverse side effects. And a new long-term study in Finland that recently came out and followed 8,749 middle-aged and older men for six years found a 46% increased risk for type 2 diabetes amongst patients taking statins after controlling for age, body mass index, smoking, physical activity, alcohol intake, family history, and other possible intervening variables. The risk rose with increased dosage, another reason to take as low a dose as possible. A larger new assessment from researchers in the United States and Sweden concluded this year that although statins effectively reduce cholesterol levels, quote, they have failed to substantially improve cardiovascular outcomes. They describe, quote, the deceptive approach statin advocates have deployed to create the, the appearance that cholesterol reduction results in an impressive reduction in cardiovascular outcome, a method which amplified the trivial beneficial effects of statins while minimizing the significance of numerous adverse effects on statin, of statin treatment, end quote. These include statistically significant increases in some cancers, in molecular weakness, molecular, sorry, muscular weakness and pain, and pathology of the central nervous system that contribute to deaths by accident, suicide, or violence. The authors devote a section to financial conflicts of interest amongst pro-statin research groups and expert committees, especially behind the 2013 revised guidelines that recommended greatly expanding the number of individuals who should be put on statins. And so if you pay attention, even just reading the New York Times, you will see indications of what might be called the statin wars between those who think it maybe should be put in the, in the, in the drinking supply and those who think that uh, they should be avoided if at all possible. This is one extended example that illustrates a general historical trend in the corporate construction of risk cultures that have medicalized our bodies and our lives. By 2012, Fanu wrote in the book Circulating Around, people were taking half again more drugs than 20 years earlier. And in the last 10 years, Americans uh, have increased the number of prescriptions that they take by one billion. Do you think Americans are that much healthier than they were 10 years ago? Starting in the 1990s, um, a, quote, crisis of inno innovation was repeatedly declared by industry leaders and its supporters as a global risk to all humankind and the future of medicine. If we can't find newer and better drugs, then everybody suffers and so does medicine. Several key reports pointed to systemic causes. Was this another example of the industry's construction of global systemic risk? This campaign succeeded in Congress taking several measures and granting companies still more monopoly rights than they had before the campaign began. But long-term historical studies, two actually, one by, out of Lilly and one out of Pfizer, concluded that the, de that the decline was a myth and that the decline was only a regression to the mean after a spike in new molecular entities in 1996. <clears throat> a crisis of innovation implies greater financial risk. So I'd like to shift over now to financial risk um, as research failures and their costs pile up. But none of the reports about financial risk and the crisis in that ever juxtapose the huge costs of R&D with revenues and gross profits, but let the numbers stand on their own. In fact, both revenues and profits have soared despite the paucity of NMEs, the most common measure used of innovation. Further, as, lo as has long been known, the corporate risks of R&D are much lower for large companies because they spread them across a portfolio of projects. 
and several factors contribute to the financial risk to large corporations varying inversely with the risks of drug candidates being approved and beginning to generate income. So the risks are extremely high at the beginning, but the investments are fairly low. And by the time you get to phase three trials, the investments are very much higher, but also much closer to when revenues begin. And the risks are quite small. Soaring revenues, profits, and rising costs, despite few important new drugs, lie behind a shelf full of highly critical books and hundreds of studies being turned out from the 1990s to the present. Those studies documented aggressive and often deceptive marketing, lobbying by a Congress of lobbyists twice the size of the United States Congress, and widespread inducements to physicians to prescribe more of the scores of newly patented minor variations that were the main products of corporate R&D. Fanu quotes Marcia Angel, the last independent editor-in-chief of the New England Journal of Medicine, who concluded that the industry, quote, has moved very far from its original high purpose of discovering and producing useful new drugs. Now principally a marketing machine to sell drugs of dubious benefit, it uses its wealth and power to co-opt every institution that might stand in its way, including the United States Congress, the FDA, academic medical centers, and the medical profession itself. By 2002, the combined profits for the top 10 drug companies in the Fortune 500 um, <clears throat> was greater than for all the other 490 corporations combined. Here we have global systemic sales and uh, we have a global systemic sales machine whose tactics Fanu, Angel, and many others have detailed. Others have described their systemic application and extension to Asia, Latin America, and the rest of the world. And there's especially an interesting literature on um, sales promotions by pharmaceutical companies in Central and Latin America. One thing that's happened during this period is that marketing departments are increasingly shaping uh, uh, research and the production of new medical knowledge from clinical trials that allege to document a drug's risks of harm and chances of benefits for patients. <clears throat> Reflecting numerous studies, Angel wrote, the drug companies increasingly design the studies. They keep the data. They don't even let researchers see the data. They analyze the data. They decide whether they are going even to publish the data. They sign contracts with the researchers and academic medical centers so that they don't get into, they don't get to publish their work unless they get permission. So you can see that the distortion starts even before publication. It is treating the researchers and academic medical centers as though they were hired guns. The previous loose coupling between academic medical centers and pharmacological laboratories and drug companies tightened. Now, since that quote, um, there's been a, a sustained, tremendous uh, effort to increase transparency. And uh, it has increased significantly, but it, what's interesting are the detailed reports of how the companies are figuring out how to be transparent without being transparent, and designing their reports in ways that have critical data missing. So, the battle continues even this week around uh, transparency of research findings. <clears throat> Out of the scores of minor variations that manifest the hidden business model of R&D, only one or two important pharmaceutical advances uh, are developed, trialed, and approved each year. They constitute only one or two percent, there we go, of all newly patented medicines. So this is 10 years of newly approved drugs. And out of the almost 1,000, two were regarded as a breakthrough, a term the industry loves to use, breakthrough drugs. 13 as real advances, 61 as having some advantages, and 918 having little or no improvement, all approved by the FDA or the AMA in Europe as uh, better. This pattern and accompanying evidence suggests that the de facto role 
of pharmaceutical research is to develop and get approved scores of new drugs with few or no clinical advantages, but with under-tested risks of harmful side effects that turn out to be serious about 20% of the time. So there's quite substantial <coughs> risks from these drugs once they're out in clinical use. Independent review groups of physicians and pharmacists conclude that about 85 to 90 percent provide few or no clinical advantages over existing drugs. And there's a new article about that in the BMJ last week. Yet all of these drugs have toxic side effects, and patent protected prices are set at about 50 to 100 times the X factory manufacturing costs. Being able to make 50 to 100 times what something costs you has, I believe, hugely contributed to the risks of new drugs increasing and their benefits decreasing. Principal amongst these are the well-documented patterns of designing clinical trials, collecting data on clinical outcomes, analyzing those outcomes and reporting them that at each closely related step minimizes finding evidence of risks and once found, minimizing their visibility. The young British sociologist, Lindsay Magui, characterizes this as the corporate construction of ignorance. The complement at each stage is to maximize the evidence of benefits and to, um, and to feature those. Uh, systemic reviews find that corporate sponsorship is itself a major variable. So this is quite interesting that in, in, in the uh, kind of objective systemic reviews, um, the, the funding source of trials itself is a major variable predicting the outcome aside from the characteristics of the drug itself. I have a note here that I just want to mention uh, because there's an interesting part of this that has to do with language. So the common term that's used, which is developed by uh, pharmaceutical companies and which you probably use without thinking, is the quote, risk-benefit ratio. But, it hi but the word risk hides what the risk is. See, so logically it should be the risk-risk ratio, right? There's a risk of harm and there's a risk of benefit. So if you're gonna call the first one risk, you should call the second one risk and not mention either one of them. Or you could mention what the outcome is of both and call it the harm-benefit ratio. But to call it the risk-benefit ratio kind of assumes there's a benefit against a risk of something we don't know what and we are not gonna mention what it is. And I just wanted to kind of attune you to that. Another one is safety. So now uh, uh, Congress and Washington and the journalists all talk about safety. And then there's safety problems and things are unsafe. And harms are never mentioned. And I think that's a problem with wellness too. So the only thing you can do if you're not well is to be unwell. Now you could be very, very unwell, like you uh, just you know, discover you had liver cancer, or you could be unwell and have a cold, and so all unwellness gets lumped into the negative of wellness. And there is this tendency now in, in commercially informed language to state kind of the ideal state and to put all the possible negative results into a large catch, linguistic catch basin. The methods for biasing clinical records and the gold standard of scientific medicine are also universal and systemic so that they increase the probability that patients and their physicians will not know the risks of harm and will overestimate chances that a given drug will benefit them. These practices are global to the degree that once trials are done, their risk hiding results get put into the drug label and then into prescription guidelines and reference sources, and they are accepted throughout the world as official scientific knowledge. So one thing we have here is the commercial construction of medical knowledge. <clears throat> Large international companies systemically use biasing techniques in the 160,000 trials that they largely fund out of the large profits generated by high monopoly prices. Most of those trials are designed for marketing purposes and are not used to get drugs approved. Companies can select the most positive ones to submit to the FDA or the EMA in Europe uh, as the basis for approving drugs with a favorable harm-benefit ratio. 
And in that way, sampling and statistical biasing uh, result in, in that whole procedure um, beyond each trial itself. Here then is a related global systemic risk that is tightly coupled with marketing results in overstating benefits and understating harms. And then gets written up into medical journals. And the writing up of medical journals has been analyzed. All this takes a lot of work and there's very few funds to do this work. But for instance, a meticulous study uh, comparing all the detailed outcomes of all the trials submitted to the FDA with how they appeared in published articles uh, several months or a few years later found that the professionally hired writers and statisticians had changed some of the endpoints and had altered the statistical analyses and had not included in the published articles some of the results of the trial submitted to the FDA. So you have another layer of biasing after the biasing of the trials is a further biasing of their publications. And, and that's in, uh, in the leading medical journals that then get pulled together into the clinical guidelines that then your physicians and the practices that your physicians are part of, like the Princeton Medical Group, uh, use and insurers use. Another key element that most tightly, uh, that more tightly couples global systemic risks from pharmaceuticals to the FDA is what researchers at the Edmund J. Safra Center for Ethics at Harvard characterize as institutional corruption of the FDA and its counterpart, the EMA, as the regulators who control what drugs are approved based on criteria and evidence they stipulate. Regulatory bodies in the rest of the world largely follow the lead of the FDA and the EMA. Uh, the concept of institutional corruption centers on the distortion or compromise of the societal mission of an institution, usually through money and direct uh, influence by powerful commercial or political interests. Under this influence, the US Congress and the European Parliament have decided to have companies pay the, the regulatory bodies for reviewing their drug candidates through large fees that companies pay each time a drug is submitted. <clears throat> this is a large conflict of interest as having companies <clears throat> um, and, uh, and so that you have public service regulators who are reviewing the evidence for given drug candidates being paid uh, n not by the government as public servants to protect patients from harmful and ineffective drugs, which was the mission of the FDA when it was founded and developed early on, but by the companies who are submitting their drugs for review. These regulators had developed rules that allow companies to control the criteria used in trials for measuring whether a drug is safe and effective. And these criteria usually do not include measures of whether new drugs are clinically better for patients than existing ones. Now, most of my neighbors assume that an FDA drug that's approved is approved because it's better for patients. In fact, the FDA usually doesn't get evidence of that and does not call for it to approve a drug. They're usually approved as through non-inferiority or placebo trials, both of which are not designed to produce that kind of evidence, and using substitute or surrogate endpoints. Um, and then I have a comment about safety. Uh, in chapter one of my book, The Risks of Prescription Drugs, these practices make up what I call the risk proliferation syndrome in pharmaceuticals. Uh, this book was commissioned by the Social Science Research Council under Craig Calhoun as part of a series of hidden risks in people's lives. And I get no royalties, by the way. Um, I don't seem to get royalties on any of my, any of my books. Um, the uh, risk proliferation syndrome explains the interconnected ways in which clinical risks are proliferated to patients from the mass marketing and prescribing of these drugs with few offsetting benefits. And if you want to see what that book looks like, I brought a copy. <clears throat> it has short essays by so several social, senior social colleagues. Um, uh, one is on, on women's bodies and the medicalization and pharmaceuticalization of, of women. Another is on children and the 
huge increase of you know, prescribing psychotropic drugs to children. Uh, another one is on statins and why a practicing physician doesn't even measure high cholesterol in, in healthy patients with no history of heart disease or diabetes um, because he's pretty clear it doesn't really matter per se what matters are other variables. And there's a history of uh, the FDA. Corporate funding of regulators has led in recent years to approving drugs with even less evidence that they are safe or clinically effective. And I brought some copies of two uh, short articles, they're only one page each, um, that the uh, BMJ, the British Medical Journal, um, asked me and a colleague to write. One is called, Why Do Cancer Drugs Get Such an Easy Ride? And how many of the cancer trials um, don't even have fundamental requirements to produce scientifically valid information, and yet they're approved. First, the trials are agreed upon, and then the drugs are approved on that evidence. And the other is on the FDA's new close about how after the crisis of safety with the Vioxx uh, 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 epidemic of harmful side effects, the new machinery for safety isn't really making things safer. And um, there's not much more being done on safety. The FDA devotes only about 10% of staff to safety issues and 90% to uh, other issues, especially around getting drugs approved rapidly. A new review published two weeks ago by a distinguished team at the London School of Economics concludes, quote, regulators in recent years have in fact progressively lowered their evidence requirements for market entry of new drugs by requiring smaller trial surrogate endpoints and placebo comparisons. So I put that in just to show you that I, this is not just my opinion, <laughs> it's coming out in the VMJ from independent sources. They've increasingly adopted expedited approvals to get new drugs on the market quicker. Such rushed approvals have important implications for drug, drug safety. And in fact, when, the, um, when reviews are accelerated for life-saving drugs, or for, or rather, I should say, for drugs for life-threatening disorders, the, the, the risk of significant harm rises from one in five, which strikes me as very high, to one in three. This risk proliferation syndrome has cascading effects on the subsequent risks that arise in treating serious adverse reactions as healthcare systems have to manage and deal with them and their costs beyond the costs of the drugs themselves. Overall, based on hospital charts, properly prescribed drugs have become the fourth leading cause of death in the United States and Europe. About 300,000 deaths a year in the United States and Europe. For each death, there are about 20 hospitalizations. Errors in prescribing that make up a substantial proportion of the Institute of Medicine's landmark report on medical errors add to these totals, as do serious adverse effects from prescribing drugs in retirement communities and nursing homes. And one might add recreational prescribing by university students and Hollywood stars. Um, a final contributor to increasing systemic risk is the $50 billion spent each year by companies on persuading physicians to prescribe newer patented drugs with high prices but with much less known about their toxic side effects. Companies spend much more on marketing drugs than on researching them. And marketing understandably plays a major role in telling researcher departments what new drugs they need to have developed. Um, a lot of this is involved in aggressive person-to-person -person marketing uh, and, per and, and in using key opinion leaders, which means retaining prominent cl clinical specialists uh, to give talks to their colleagues so that the marketing is not being done by the company. 
and that also circumvents prohibitions against recommending prescribing for indications beyond those in the label, but a colleague can recommend anything. So uh, the, uh, uh, the field is open for peer-to-peer um, -peer recommendations. Um, this all led to Howard Brody, a primary care physician and professor of bioethics, and, and, and me to uh, develop what we call the inverse benefit law of pharmaceutical marketing. I think I only have a couple of those. Here's, here's one. Um, and the inverse benefit law holds that the ratio of benefits to harms amongst patients taking new drugs tends to vary inversely with how extensively they are marketed. This law is manifested through six basic marketing strategies, reducing thresholds for diagnosing disease, relying on surrogate endpoints, exaggerating safety claims, exaggerating efficacy claims, creating new diseases, and en encouraging unproved uses. But the fundamental dynamic is actually pretty simple and obvious. The more widely you market and prescribe, let us say antipsychotics, um, the more diluted become their benefits as you are prescribing them to less and less clearly core psychotic patients. Okay? But their harms do not become diluted, they become more widespread. So the inverse benefit law of pharmaceutical marketing is that the more, the more they're marketed, the more diluted become their benefits, and the more widespread their risks of harm. I've not had time to explore a major contributor to um, systemic <clears throat> to systemic risk and benefits of research and marketing of new drugs, namely patents and related IP protections like data exclusivity. Uh, while they are widely regarded as essential to pharmaceutical innovation, I hope I can find the time and opportunity to explore that claim more closely and to trace out the linked consequences of strong IP. To what extent is strong IP also an obstacle to innovation? To what extent does acquiring it become the main goal rather than seeking clinically superior medicines? I'd also like to investigate how IP protections have become globalized <coughs> and a systemic obstacle to risk reduction. Um, I would like to critically assess the claims by prominent civic voices that patents are or will cause great harm to millions of patients uh, in developing countries for small gains in sales and profits. Tight coupling inherent in IP rights has led to loosening it while retaining those rights uh, through various kinds of adjustments in the World Trade Organization rules. Um, which is an interesting example of loosening couple, coupling as a strategic to retaining core tight coupling. And I think that's an interesting dynamic of loosening and tightening within um, the, uh, the dynamics of what's going on with international IP rights. So um, I hope you found this of some interest and I wanna end with uh, three questions for discussion. To what extent do the differing roles of agency and responsibility in different global systemic risk cases matter? And should a typology then be developed? Um, should global systemic risks always devote substantial attention to the individuals who are ultimately affected or may be affected by institutional net and network actions? And is global systemic risk now big business. Um, I thought, you know, are, yes, are the constant calls for, from home security companies urging me to install a home security system like my physician urging me to take a statin for my high cholesterol? Thank you. Yes. I don't have an answer to any of the questions that you asked, but I do have a question of you, if I may. Yes. Um, so I work in public health. Uh, I work specifically on overdose prevention. And what? Overdose prevention. Oh. Mm -hmm. um, and so we um, have a lot of nasty things to say about drug companies and painkillers, opioids. 
mm -hmm. um, and sort of combining opioids with benzodiazepines and other drugs. Mm. So in your framework, sort of looking at a risk framework, what what do the harms have, where, where's the pressure point for, on harm for pharmaceutical companies to change their direction with basically, you know, what they're doing is they continue to create the same drug in a different format, then it's time release, then it's more milligrams or what have you. So where's the pressure point in terms of creating harm? For the company? Mm -hmm. Okay, yes. Do, do you understand my question? Yes, I do, mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. It's a very timely uh, question. It's getting a lot of attention in the medical and popular um, press. And op opioid addiction is a serious problem. And of course, at the center of it is Purdue. And um, <clears throat> uh, Purdue uh, was for decades, I don't know if you know this, uh, a marketing department for company, I mean a marketing company, a company that specialized in figuring out how best to market drugs. And it was founded by Sackler, who funded the Sackler Museum in Washington, DC, and many other things from the millions that he made. And people kept telling me as I was doing historical work that Sackler was kind of this secret, un, uh, uh, sort of inaccessible key to a lot of what went on in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. Well, anyway, um, well, first to give sort of the other side of the answer, uh, the, the law and practices <clears throat> of pharmaceutical companies uh, holds that they just make the drug. And if you overdose or you choose to go to two physicians and uh, anyway, anything that you do that is not their problem. They just developed a drug and made it. Um, and actually, the use of physicians is, is a central defense. So another central defense <clears throat> is, um, well, there was a qualified professional who did the prescribing. So sue him, don't sue us. <clears throat> and this has led some people to point out that um, starting in 1938, an increasing proportion of, of medicines uh, were required to be obtained through a prescription. <clears throat> and the question now is, has that gone much further than it needs to? Are there a lot of prescription drugs that actually people could manage and decide for themselves with all the warnings and so forth? Are there, are there a lot of prescription drugs that are no more dangerous than over-the-counter drugs? And, and thereby, removing this very critical um, way in which companies can't be, um, you see, so if there, if there were no prescribing physician and there was um, a record of promotion and advertising, then you could sue the company as an agent of overdose. Do you see? But, but with a physician as an intermediate, as a qualified, licensed, even board certified intermediary, it greatly weakens the argument. So that's part of the answer. Um, I think it, it's a question to be interesting to look at, and one way I would look at it is to look at the ways in which Purdue has responded to all the, all the pressures and is now trying to be a very responsible company and to cut down on overdosing. Um, because all the ways in which they do that are tacit admissions to their contributions to the epidemic of overdoses from Oxycontin. So as you probably know, they, um, they have developed new, um, very protective kinds of uh, casings that are harder for people who want it as a street drug to break down. And, um, and the, the, the DEA is very sort of onto the case of overdosing. But I think in the end, um, there's not too much harm that can come to them except um, shaming and, uh, and political and citizens' pressure, although that can have quite a bit of impact. 
Well, I wish it were more helpful. Sir. <laughs> Given the enormous costs in developing new drugs yes. and getting them approved, who but pharma uh, uh, can and should develop them? Yes. And, and if the answer is pharma, yes. how can the development process, in your estimation, be improved to remove right. these uh, right. multiple opportunities for corruption? Well, I, so I, I left out, the, uh, because it was getting too long, a section on, on the, the myths of high costs of R&D. Um, and I don't know if you want me to go through that quickly, but um, uh, the official high figures have uniformly come for the last 35 years from three economists who are retained by the industry, DeMacy, Grabowski, and Hansen, before it was Hansen, Grabowski, and DeMacy. So they're sort of a trio who keep exchanging um, uh, order of names. Um, <clears throat> based on unverified cost, R&D cost reports to uh, an industry-sponsored think tank where only they have access to the data. Even the companies don't have access to each other's data. And, and so uh, a colleague of my, a health economist and I, deconstructed the, uh, the figure, the new figures, $2.6 billion of R&D cost per average new drug, um, and, and identified the inflators that were used in the econometric models, then removed those inflators, still using the same data, which is unverified. And so another one of our points is no one should believe any estimates based on any of these unverified figures. But if you're going to play that game and if you're going to accept at least the starting point, then one could at least uh, uh, demystify the inflators. And, it, and, and the average comes out to about one-tenth uh, the estimate, about 260 million. But it varies a lot by types of drugs. So some, kind, some classes of drugs are very much higher than the average, and some are very much lower. But that actually, I just thought that would interest you, but it doesn't get actually to the core of your question. So I think more to the core is um, something we have to think about, and it would require uh, a societal rethinking of your question. Um, so one thing to think about is that for decades, um, the, the research and and discovery of new medicines was exempted from patents as societal goods in many countries, including the golden years in, when Germany was far and away the most innovative engine of pharm pharmacological science. Um, and I haven't had a chance yet to study um, how that all worked. Also, the Medical Research Council in England that, uh, that is the source of a lot of major grants, has been for decades, required that any principal investigator uh, not uh, patent any discovery. Again, because they said any discovery was by definition paid for by the public, and the project was for society, and therefore it, uh, the, the, the uh, the benefits of discovery should be shared by society. As you um, probably know, Jonas Salk refused to patent the Salk vaccine on the same kind of argument. Um, and another element to think about is, and maybe you can help me with this because it sounds like you're pretty well informed, I can't find any evidence that the, that the explosion of patenting since the Bayh-Dole Act of 1980 has led to significantly more clinically important drugs. Um, we, we have you know, independent rating, uh, uh, ratings by uh, expert panels, and the rate is small and flat. So how come patents, the patenting has increased tenfold, and the number of clinically superior new drugs has not increased? So, my question to the great uh, advocates, and there are many of them, of, of patents as being absolutely critical to pharmaceutical innovation, how do they explain and where is there evidence that it is? Okay. Uh, a related part of that are some studies, one in the New England Journal of Medicine not too long ago, review, trying to uh, first identify all the major advances in the last 25 years in pharmaceutical research. And then asking, 
how, me- how many of the discoveries that underlie those drugs were publicly funded by NIH, the MCR, th- then th- there's a whole German and Japanese, and, and there are other uh, substantial bodies of publicly funded research institutes, and it's quite a high number. So this is not to say that there aren't really uh, bright and talented researchers and scientists in pharmaceutical companies, but it is to um, question the conviction that a lot of people, especially in Princeton, walk around with, and that is that they are the, 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 the genius engine of pharmaceutical innovation, that's clinically important. And, and, and uh, in a BMJ review, a 25-year review that came out in 2012 that I co-authored with uh, Joe Lection again, um, we, um, we concluded, because the evidence kind of makes it so clear, that the major products of R&D are scores of minor variations. And, and, and all of those are patented, and actually some of them are new molecular entities. Uh, and researchers have told me, I can't begin to, to know whether this is true or not, but they tell me it's not that hard to come up with a new molecule. Uh, you can just tweak a couple of the parts of it and, and you have, technically speaking, a new molecule. But maybe, are you a researcher? Well. <laughs> So I'm a physician, and okay. uh, after a long career in academic medicine, I moved here. Okay. I've worked for several major pharmaceutical companies. I'm okay. very sympathetic to what you say. Oh. I would also recommend that the people read Stephen Brill's piece in the Huffington Post about a local pharmaceutical company. Yes. Uh, who I worked J&J. for until remain nameless, yes. and, and it's so-called Credo. Yes. Um, and I think your, your last comment is absolutely right. I work for a company now that is working on the fourth in class of a new diabetes medicine, each one of which is a tweaked molecule uh, based uh-huh. on the same. Um, so you should molecule. learn how to tweak molecules. We would just, you know, we could fund all of our graduate, all the graduate students, yeah, and, and their projects. It would be great. So I, I, I really think what okay. you say is absolutely correct. Well, I just it's a dirty business. I've just finished a, a, a book about a, a large uh, research institute. It's in Milan in Bergamo, two beautiful places to visit, by the way. And Mario, Negri. And Mario Negri, you know it. And it has 51 laboratories, and it patents nothing on two grounds, on ethical grounds, sort of like uh, Jonas Salk, that all their research is, is funded directly or indirectly by, by the people and by society, and anything they discover should be for them. But then uh, it, the, their discoveries end up being patented by somebody else. Uh, but also scientific grounds that if you get into patenting, and this is the, the one that I think I'd really like your view on, they say patenting corrupts every step of the scientific process. And so their, their principal concern is that they as researchers don't corrupt themselves by saying, well, which, which, which decision should we make here that is most likely to attract venture capitalists? And venture capitalists want uh, high, quick profits to get out, and then, and then by then selling it uh, for much more to a proper full service pharmaceutical company that then may do phase three trials and marketing and whole FDA approval and all of that and eventually make uh, still more money, but the venture capitalist wants to get, as they do in other industries, get in early and get out pretty early uh, and, and make uh, five or 10 times what they, uh, what they invested. So if you're thinking, well, what, what would most interest a venture capitalist about my lab and the way I'm doing my work? It just completely distorts, they think, they believe. And uh, so they don't patent on principle. They also do other remarkable things, which are in this book, which is called Good Pharma. The title of the new book is Good Pharma, and it's about a, oh, you're welcome. Uh, It's about a model of ethical uh, 
uh, research with moral integrity. They only do trials on uh, that sample the, 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 pop, the entire population that's going to be using it rather than sampling from a, uh, um, a population that excludes people who are most likely to have adverse side effects, which of course biases the trials. And they only, they don't use surrogate endpoints unless there's no choice. And they never do placebo trials unless there's no choice. They do what's called comparative superiority trials, which in plain English means, does this drug help patients as, as measured by clinical outcomes? And that's about three or 4% of all the 160,000 trials in the world. So uh, very few entities do that, but they do only superior, clinical superiority trials. Yes? So I wondering if you could give me sort of your, your kind of ironic perspective <laughs> on, on two things. So one is the proliferation of use of electronic health records. Oh. Will uh -huh. the ability to do retrospective studies, will that increase transparency, or is, there likely, is that uh -huh. likely to be co-opted in some way? That's pretty interesting. Yeah, you want and to pass that back. The yeah. second issue uh -huh. is um, precision medicine. So if you, oh. you know, have, um, if, if your perspective is that all of these um, uh, pharmaceutical company mantras uh -huh. tend to have some way of, you know, sort of Im increasing their power, since precision medicine is the big thing of right now. Could you what define, could you define precision medicine for us? Well, you know, precision medicine, uh, sorry, precision medicine is the targeting of pharmaceuticals to smaller subsets of populations um, yeah. and allowing the FDA to, um, or, or okay. Convincing the FDA that um, using smaller subsets of populations is an acceptable way of doing a clinical trial because that medicine is only for the people that have this genetic profile or right, right. this. Okay. So that that's, you know, what does that do in terms of? Okay. So on electronic data records, what comes to mind, which um, could apply to any electronic records and uh, well, it's too bad that Paul is not here because he's done studies of, of computer and electronic records more generally, um, is it all depends what you put in and how, how the categories are measured and so on. In graduate school, we talked about GIGO. Do you still talk about GIGO? Garbage in, garbage out? No? <laughs> uh, anyway, by analogy, um, you know, it all depends how the, the records, the, 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 uh, the details of what is put in are defined and measured. And, and so I think what one can say is electronic me medical records will amplify in a good use, greater transparency and, and, and quality of work, and in a um, distorted example will amplify the worsening, but I'm just that that just comes to mind as sort of a logical response on precision medicine. Well, I'm you know you can tell I'm pretty skeptical. Um, I even now and then take a a, a pill that I found online uh, when I uh, when I think I'm being pharmaphobic. I take an antiphobic pill. Um, just to try to straighten me out. But anyway, um, uh, I'm wary because, for example, we do know there's been a, a, a really nice review of all the drugs approved for orphan drugs. Uh, sorry, orphan, uh, or, uh, review of orphan drugs for rare diseases. And, and what's interesting about orphan drugs is everyone thinks, like little orphan Annie, that uh, it's just wonderful that you've discovered an orphan drug and you're helping these people who have a rare disease that no one's paid any attention to, um, but now are getting attention because of the millions of extra dollars promised in return for doing it. And 85% of those drugs have no evidence of clinical benefit. So everyone assumes they're wonderful and better, but. But if you actually ask of any one orphan drug, 
could you please show me, I'd like to read about the, 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 the evidence of improved clinical outcomes for, pa for the patient, uh, you will find uh, most of the time that there isn't. So my, I'm, I'm just, cons oh, and then this, this review that we did of, of uh, you know, why do cancer drugs get such an easy ride? And I mean, cancer is, I mean, there are many, many cancers, but it's not nearly as precise as precision medicine, which gets really down to uh, genetic composition and interaction in, in very, very small samples. All of this, of course, justifies astronomical prices under, for very small samples, and the whole large marketing strategy is what's called niche busters. So instead of having blockbusters that, that sell a billion dollars each, you can have a niche buster that can make uh, a million dollars on a thousand or 500 or in your case, maybe 50 patients if you charge enough. Uh, is there any evidence or reason to believe that the trials and measures in those precision medicine initiatives are measuring real clinical improvements. Do you happen to know? No. no. Okay. Yeah, we need an expert, and I'm not that expert. So, uh, yes, sir. I went to New York Presbyterian Hospital, and they could do the director of research for motion sickness diseases. And on the advice of a brain surgeon, because I have a benign tremor. Mm -hmm. And uh, I asked him about new drugs that might be available. He says he doesn't know anything about them. His research is, does not use anything, has nothing to do with drugs. And also, hmm. I asked him about clinical trials, because I did all the research on clinical trials myself. He says, no, we're not doing any clinical trials. Hmm. The only research we're doing so I would like you to be me. He wants me to be my brain to him. So they, mm. they are doing pathological research. Okay. Now, the thing about clinical trials, if you go online, you can find all the clinical trials that they said at the NIH, and you can find it for specific illnesses. Mm -hmm. But when you read those, the results of those clinical trials, they don't give you a complete picture. Mm -hmm. Because they will tell you one or two successful uh, examples, but they don't tell you what happened to the other 15 or 20 uh, people who were in the trials. Hmm. So, you know, and when you come to clinical trials, it, what it appears to be is a farce. Hmm. That a group of doctors get together and they do a clinical trial and they, and they give you a certain amount of research, yes. but you get no real information on it. Yes. Now, the drug that, that worked apparently well in clinical trials is called Optimal 1. Okay. for people with benign tremor. But you can't find that drug anyway. Hmm. I looked all over the world and that drug, yeah, you can get it from China. It's a food additive drug, and some people have taken the drug in England, but there's no, no information on that. Hmm. So, and the, the last thing that really bothers me is the, the patent, because what's gonna happen with the uh, genetically engineered drugs? Mm -hmm. They pack me all kinds of genetic and engineering things with, with no real proof of effectiveness and only yes. very minor controls on them. Yes. And creating a huge monopoly for the people who have those drugs. So all yes. of these things are impa impacting not only the research yes. in pharma, but they're impa impacting the government's approach to healthcare. It's a very interesting multifaceted comment. Thank you for it. Let me just pick out a couple of them. Now, I'm, I'm guessing, correct me if I'm wrong, that when you were using the word clinical trials in the middle of what you were saying, yeah. um, and you said, you know, a bunch of doctors get together and do one, and they mention a f what happened to a few patients but not the others. These are, this is another kind of world, uh, an, a, a growing world, of, I guess, what I would call informal, n not scientific, quote, clinical trials. And I don't know that world too well. I keep running into them. So uh, we were having uh, dinner with our granddaughter and her parents, or I should say her parents and our granddaughter. And, um, and the man at the next 
table was uh, very loquacious and had an oxygen tank and so on. And I got to talk to him. Well, he has flown from California to Penn and moved here to be in a, quote, clinical trial. And I asked a bit more about it. Was there a control? Oh, no, there's no control arm. I thought, hmm, no control arm. What are you going to compare it with? And of course, you compare before and after. Um, and uh, how many were in the trial? I think it was 17, but they're always recruiting. They'd be happy to have an 18th or a 19th. This is not a proper clinical trial. <laughs> But I think you're right that there are hundreds or thousands of those, and pr probably particularly in the United States. So one interesting question is how American is that? Can, can, you know, can uh, physician researchers and top people at Manchester or Oxford or, or, or Frankfurt or wherever, Berlin, um, kind of get together and put a notice in a local paper and see who, who, who signs up and, and, and do some social networking and have people come and, and go from 5 to 10 to 15 to 20 and just sort of do it as they like. Um, but people do, this man was very excited about being here. He would changed his whole life and, and left his California home um, because he has a serious condition and there's this trial at Penn. So um, that's just a comment on, you've triggered in me uh, a point that I, I often overlook, which is I think there's another whole world I know almost nothing about, which are these ad hoc trials that are done by academic physicians. Uh, on the patenting, the last part, um, when you were talking, it made me think of how Monsanto has sort of patented the natural world, uh, every seed known to God. Uh, has been patented by Monsanto, and by analogy, the same sort of thing is happening. And, you know, is the seed better? Is it better for having been patented? I don't think the poor seed knows that it's been patented. Uh, <laughs> but it certainly gives them a, you know, a monopoly grip for two decades over anyone tweaking, tweaking it. And we've had particularly anthropologists come to Princeton and talk in, in uh, powerful and moving ways about the ways in which natural husbandry in, in, um, in cultures in Mexico and, and, and Central and Latin America have come up with sort of interesting and very good kinds of seed. And then some company gets a hold of that and patents it. And then even they can't get their own seed anymore <laughs> uh, without paying an arm and a leg for it. And anyway, so I think you're right to be concerned about, about uh, genetic patenting, and, and especially when there's no clear result. All, all of this sort of adds to my interest in patenting and my concern about the ways in which there's over-patenting. And I think the two biggest developments, maybe we should end here, but the two biggest developments going on are in Brazil and India. Uh, both countries have, particularly India, as we all know, have uh, really terrific research institutes and universities. And, and, and they want to really foster innovation to find better medicines. But they also have huge numbers of very poor people who need to have those medicines available at very low costs. So how do you encourage and foster innovation while not ending up making the, the, the fruits of innovation unaffordable to the governments and to the poor? How do you pull that off? And so there are a number of, 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 one is to kind of roll back to an earlier period of patenting that, um, that, that denies, and this is what India's doing, they're denying um, <coughs> use patents, um, patents for time release, patents for new formulations, patents for new combinations. If you discover something that is novel and new, you will get one patent in India. So of all things, this is something that's unbelievable to Americans and it was unbelievable to the company. Uh, Gleevec, which is widely regarded by every oncologist I know as the most significant advance that has been done in, in cancer medication in the last 25 years, just a phenomenally superior drug, actually is a new use. And the Indian Supreme Court said, no patent in India, because it's already been patented 
it would be like uh, Viagra. Viagra was a, a, a drug for heart disease, and then they noticed that uh, the patients had erections, and they went from there. That's a new use. And patent, that's, in India, that's not patentable. So one way is they're kind of uh, clawing back, as the British say, to um, a, a tighter and, and more original notion of what patenting should be about. That's one strategy. Another is to, um, <clears throat> to think about the length of patents. So patents have been lengthened, mainly around uh, things like this crisis of innovation uh, uh, campaign and, and, and other ways in which the industry says, well, we need m longer patents and longer patents. And if you give us longer patents, we'll have more innovation. Well, that's not at all clear, because at some point, as a number of legal scholars have written about, the longer you have patents, the more likely you're going to have monopolistic behavior and less innovation, because innovation comes from the patent ending. Okay? You get protection as, as, as a congratulations for having invented something. And then it ends, and then you have to be innovative again. I wonder if you didn't have to be innovative again. And you could just have a patent that was 30, 40, 50, I mean, try it out, 50-year patents, why not? And one kind of answer would be, so why bother innovating if we've got a 50-year? And this is actually an issue with copyright, which now is, is the lifetime of the creator plus 70 years. And there's a whole um, another literature about <coughs> copyright being far too long. So that's another discussion is, or, or about making patents for some kinds of diseases uh, shorter and others longer. I'm not sure that's going to go anywhere. But, but to me, the historically most interesting thing is, is that there was a time when there was a quite a wide consensus that medicines, I prefer this European term, were for patients and to help patients get better. And that was a societal need and was not like making a better train or a better car and should be exempted from patenting altogether. Um, and it did not seem to slow down uh, innovation. Yes? Another area is the manufacture of pharmaceuticals. Yes. In the 1990s, I did a year's volunteer work here in New Jersey mm -hmm. promoting quality control and control quality management mm -hmm. with pharmaceutical companies. Mm -hmm. And one of the things I learned is that they, weren't, they don't have standards. They refuse to use the word standard. Really? So I asked them, I said, wow. well, how do, you, how do you measure the effectiveness of the drug? How do you control the quality? Right. They said, we have benchmarks. Now, a benchmark, that's a terminology which says it's a kind of a standard, but it's not standard. Standards in the 90s, you could go to the National Institutes in Washington yes. of standards, but they don't have that anymore. And I think that's today, much of the manufacturing is done offshore. That's very interesting. And J&J, &J, by the way, um, I, I just don't see why they or any other large wealthy manufacturer would allow this, has, has had extensive recalls and, and, and fines and penalties for manufacturing uh, uh, contaminated batches. And I think, well, if you're making that much money, why don't you at least have your facilities, you know, clean and run smoothly and have everyone in white lab coats and make sure everything, like, I don't know, uh, Apple or Dell or anyone else, you know, everything is very high quality control. Um, but well, anyway. That note, yes. thank you so much. Thank you all for coming. It was great. Good question. <laughs>